Greetings. I want to welcome each of you to today's TechGenix webinar on next generation per app ADCs, what you need to know. Thank you for joining us and let's get started. Today's webinar is sponsored by Kemp. Kemp powers an always on application experience for enterprises and service providers, leveraging an agile per app load balancing ADC consumption model, predictive analytics, and automated issue resolution, Kemp is radically simplifying how customers optimize, analyze, and secure their applications across private and multi-cloud environments. Kemp counts more than 25,000 customers and 60,000 application deployments in 115 countries. I'll be the moderator for today's event. My name is Roger, and I have a few quick housekeeping items to cover. All participant lines are muted, so if you have any issues and need to communicate with me during today's event, please use the chat feature on the control panel of your screen and send me a message and I'll try to help. We also encourage you to use the same chat panel to submit any questions or comments you have during the presentations. We'll be collecting those and we'll be uh, submitting them to our speakers to address as many as possible. Any questions that our speakers can't get to, before we conclude today's webinar, we'll be forwarded on to them so that they can follow up with you by email. Our speakers for today are Brian Posey and Frank Yu. Brian Posey is a freelance technology author, 17-time Microsoft MVP, and a commercial scientist astronaut candidate, as you can tell from the photo we're sharing. Prior to going freelance, Brian worked as a CIO for a national chain of hospitals and healthcare facilities. He also has served as a network engineer for the United States Department of Defense at Fort Knox and has worked as a network administrator for some of the largest insurance companies in America. Frank Yu is a Kemp Solutions architect and a technology evangelist. He translates products and technologies into business needs and values, and he looks at evolving technology landscapes and how it impacts IT architectures and organizations. He also writes blogs, produces white papers, and speaks at conferences and events relating to application networking technologies. Mr. Yu has over 25 years of experience building large-scale networks and working with high-performance application technologies, including deep packet inspection, network security, and application delivery. With that, I will now turn it over to Brian to get things started. Brian? Hello, everyone. Today, I want to talk about the pitfalls of the legacy licensing model. Before I get started in my presentation, as was mentioned, IT is only half of the work that I do. The other half is I've been training for the last several years for a commercial space mission to study polar mesospheric clouds. I don't know if any of you managed to make it out to my presentation at Microsoft Ignite last year, but I presented with another crew member named Heidi. And here you can see what Heidi and I have been up to. This picture was taken a couple of weeks ago. We're in our spacesuit strapped into an Orion capsule, getting ready to begin a simulation. You can also see over on the left side of the screen our mission patch, and you can see me in a pool in my spacesuit trying to climb into a life raft, which is a lot more difficult than you would think. At any rate, let's go ahead and get started. I want to begin by talking about the legacy hardware acquisition model. And this is the model that is generally used to purchase hardware in our data centers. For the purposes of this particular example, the actual hardware is irrelevant. It could be just about anything. But there are several steps that IT pros generally go through, and this has held true for a really long period of time. The first step is to analyze the performance needs. This is generally done by performance monitoring so that we can see what kind of performance we're going to need in our newly acquired hardware. That's generally straightforward, even though it is a pretty tedious process. The second step is to project future demand growth over the life of the hardware. This is where things get difficult because if we purchase hardware today, that hardware needs to meet today's needs. But remember, hardware is a long-lived asset, and we need that hardware to not only meet our needs today, but over the entire lifespan of the hardware, which a lot of organizations do a hardware refresh every five years. So we have to figure out what kind of needs this hardware is going to have to meet five years into the future. That's a tall order. So after making these types of projections, the next step is to purchase the hardware that best aligns with the capacity planning estimates. And then from there, all we can really do is hope that we've guessed correctly. Now, as you can imagine, there are quite a few problems with this legacy approach. The biggest problem has to do with hardware sizing, because if the actual growth exceeds the projections, then the hardware might not be adequate. If, for example, you're purchasing something like, say, a hardware load balancer, and you end up getting 10 times the amount of traffic to your application than what you projected, 
well then that load balancer may not be able to keep up with the demand. But the opposite can also be true. Let's say for a moment that we estimate our needs for the next few years and the application doesn't receive nearly as much traffic as we projected. Maybe we get 10 times less traffic than we estimated. Well, in a case like that, the load balancer is certainly going to be able to handle the demand, but the problem is that much of the capacity is being wasted. So we've essentially wasted a lot of our investment in that hardware. And then another thing that people don't generally talk about a lot is that once you've done all of this capacity planning work, you may find that whatever vendor you choose to go with doesn't have a model that exactly matches with your projected needs. They may not have a model that has the exact amount of memory that you estimate that you're going to need or the exact amount of CPU resources that you estimate that you're going to need or something like that. So in that type of situation, what you'll generally end up having to do is buy the next model up so that you can make sure that your needs are going to be met. And that, of course, means that you're paying for capacity that, according to your own estimates, is never going to be needed. Now, there is another problem, and that problem, as we all know very, very well, is that hardware is expensive. And because of the cost of data center hardware, there's sometimes a temptation to pull double duty and get our hardware to handle multiple workloads simultaneously. Now, this might not necessarily be something that we want to do, but we're all familiar with the ever-shrinking IT budget. So there's very often pressure from above to make our hardware do more with less. And as a matter of fact, this was the entire model that drove the server virtualization industry. I mean, think about it. For a long time, we ran individual workloads on physical servers. So a lot of the server's capacity was wasted. And because of that, some organizations started trying to run multiple workloads on a single server, even though that violated best practices. In doing that, you could introduce a number of security risks, and you could potentially cause stability problems for those applications. So that's where the hardware virtualization market came from. The virtualization vendors realized that servers had all of this capacity that was being wasted and came up with a safe way of running multiple applications on each server. So that's where we are today. And the same uh, problem can be extended to the world of load balancers because hardware load balancers are expensive. So even though it might be an ideal fit to have one load balancer per application, a lot of organizations will try to put one giant load balancer in front of all of their applications just as a way of trying to cut cost a little bit. So with that said, I want to transition for a moment to the cloud model. Now this is something that I'm sure we're all familiar with, but I'm going to review things just a little bit for the benefit of anybody who might be new. So the cloud way of doing things has been widely regarded as being the inexpensive approach or less expensive approach to IT. As a matter of fact, because of this, a lot of organizations have adopted a cloud-first, cloud-by-default, or cloud-only approach to deploying new workloads. The reason why the cloud has become so popular is because it shifts the entire model of IT spending from CapEx to OpEx. CapEx, for anybody who might not be familiar with the term, is short for capital expenditure. It refers to making a big investment up front in hardware or software licenses or some other asset whereas OPEX has to do with operating expenses. It's the pay-as-you-go approach rather than making a big investment. So when I think of public cloud, I like to think of it as a utility. I compare it to things like electricity or the water coming into your home or something like that. And the reason why I do that is because there are a lot of similarities between public cloud resources and the utilities that you use every day, starting with capacity. Let's take water, for example. I don't know how it is where you live, but where I live, the water company really doesn't care how much water you use. They just bill you based on the amount that you consume. So it doesn't matter if I'm filling up a glass to get a drink of water or if I'm filling up a swimming pool. The capacity is available, and I simply get billed for the amount that I use. Now, another important comparison here is that the utility companies use pay-as-you-go pricing. The water company isn't going to say, okay, we're getting into the summer months now, and we're guessing that you're probably going to end up filling up a swimming pool, so we're going to bill you for that water in advance. It doesn't work that way. I don't even own a swimming pool, so I'm not going to get billed for that amount. Now, having said that, the public cloud works the same way. You only get billed for the resources that you use. So why is this important? Well, it's important for the economic reasons that I mentioned earlier. First of all, you're saving yourself from making a big upfront investment. 
perhaps more importantly, you're not paying for hardware whose full capacity you may never even end up using. And then beyond that, the public cloud allows you to be much more dynamic. The resource allocation can change to adapt to changing business conditions, and that's a huge consideration. So to put this into perspective, consider the retail model. Let's suppose for a moment that there's an organization that operates as an online retailer. And like any other online retailer, sales fluctuate throughout the year. Sales might be relatively flat throughout the summer, and then typically there's going to be a big spike near the end of the year as we get into the holiday season. And then, of course, once you get past the holidays, there's usually a dip that occurs right around January. So not only does sales fluctuate, but also the amount of traffic that occurs on this organization's website will also fluctuate along with those sales demands. So let's think about this in terms of a physical hardware load balancer. If this particular online retailer purchased a hardware load balancer in front of their application, that load balancer would have to be robust enough that it could handle all of the demands of the peak season. Not just today, but the holiday season five years from now. So presumably this retailer wants to grow, and they're going to have to project that growth in order to get a load balancer that's going to be able to meet the demand of the holiday season well into the future. So that's a tall order. Now, on the other hand, the other option is going to be to use a cloud-based load balancer. And the nice thing about the cloud-based load balancer is that it can dynamically scale to accommodate the changes in website traffic that occur throughout the year. So in January, when the sales are really, really low, that load balancer isn't doing a lot and the organization isn't incurring much of a cost. Now, on the other hand, when we get into the holiday season and sales go through the roof, that load balancer is going to be able to scale to meet that demand. Now, of course, this is going to result in some extra costs because the organization is consuming more resources from that hardware load balancer. But remember, this is a retail organization. All of that extra traffic translates into sales. So while expenses do go up, there's also increased revenue at that time of year to make up for that difference. Now, there's one more advantage to uh, using the cloud that I haven't talked about yet. And that is, when it comes to cloud-based load balancers, there's nothing stopping you from placing a dedicated load balancer in front of every single one of your applications. Because remember, we're talking about the cloud here. There's no acquisition cost. You only pay for the resources that you use. So because of that, there's really no penalty for deploying multiple load balancers. You can deploy as many as you want, and you're paying for the same amount of traffic as if you just had one cloud load balancer that serviced everything. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, there are a number of benefits to using a separate load balancer for each one of your applications. For one thing, it can make application management a lot less complex. And depending on which load balancer you use, there might even be some metrics that you can get from those load balancers that can help you to better understand the performance and the traffic received by your applications. But probably the best reason of all is that if a failure were to occur at the load balancer level, then that failure is only going to impact a single application, whereas if that load balancer were linked to all of your applications, then the failure would be much more widespread and impact multiple applications. So that's going to do it for me. At this point, I want to turn it over to the speaker from Kemp. Brian, thank you very much for the introduction and that insightful discussion about load balancing and the per app and what we're going to talk about today, the per app ADC or application delivery controller model. And like you said, the, the problem is moving away from the legacy hardware into this per app and cloud model. But there's a history that we want to go through and there's other things we want to discuss, discuss as we talk about this per app application delivery load balancing model. So let's move into the slides. So let's take a little history uh, lesson and let's look back about 10 years, that's eons in internet terms. But back in the old days, like you said, Brian, we are moving towards virtualization. We wanted to virtualize these applications to take advantage of server resources, and we put multiple applications on these server resources. So here we have a very simple diagram. That icon in the middle is my load balancer, and I have my clients going to these applications that reside on these virtual machines. And we thought, wow, this is really good. It gives us a lot of flexibility to put these applications on this common off-the-shelf hardware and software, this COP platform, where we can now deploy our applications anywhere quickly and easily without these dedicated resources. 
And we thought, well, this is so good. Let's expand. Let's start doing this for everything. So now we have lots of applications that our customers, internal and external, are going to. And of course, we need the load balancer to load balance these applications on these servers in this infrastructure in this virtualized world. And any typical customer might have anywhere from, depending upon the size of the uh, the business, might have anywhere from 10 to hundreds of applications in their network. So there's a large number of applications, there's a large number of servers, there's this big data center that we're building for this virtualized environment to support these virtual machines and these applications. And then as we continue moving forward and more towards the current day, now maybe a few years ago, we start thinking, okay, we virtualize these virtual machines. And we have these applications sitting on these servers. Well, really and truly, these applications can be broken up into multiple components. So let's start looking at this concept called container. So we now have containers such as Docker using technologies like Kubernetes and Mesos and these other things. And we now want to load balance these containers, which are smaller contained units of these applications or pieces of these applications that we need to load balance. And here's one thing that we need to now start thinking about. Not only do we have this north-south communication going from the clients to the applications, as you can see from the top down in this diagram, but now we also need to load balance this east-west communication between the different components of the application, whether it's the front-end engine versus the middleware uh, component that does all the heavy lifting or the back-end database. There's now communications in between the application components that need to be load balanced. So now we have load balancers within multiple aspects of our environment. And this is very typical for us to see in a customer base today. So we think, okay, let's break this down in containers and this is really great. And we really have an environment that looks great. And now let's even move further, more towards modern day internet technology. And now we have this concept of microservices. So let's take these containers and these applications and let's break them apart even more. And now we have these microservices, which are little components and aspects of these engines of these applications that these customers and users are connecting to. And we need to now load balance these microservices. As, as you can see in the complexity of this diagram, we have all these little microservices down below, and they need to be low balanced between each other. So now this is becoming a very complicated environment from a technology perspective, but there's advantages that we're wanting that we're wanting to take advantage of. We want this to make it easier and quicker and faster for us to bring the market. We want to be able to make changes on a small scale and impact large scale without having to make bulk changes like we did in old days where we had the huge patches that took weeks or months to deploy. So now we have this microservices architecture. But you know what, really and truly, there's a problem that we see moving forward. The part of the problem is that I can guarantee you almost no environment, IT environment today, is consistent. You're going to have a mix of all these things that we talked about. You might have applications that reside on their specific hardware platform or on their server, dedicated server. You have virtualized apps that sit in these virtualized environments, whether it be Hyper-V, KVM, VMware, all these hypervisor, hyper-converged environments. You have these containers, and these containers are sitting in these environments as well. And you have the microservices, and you have a mix of all these different components, and they all need to be load balanced. So we have this load balancer sitting in front of all these clients sitting on top, going to all these different components underneath, and we have the load balancing in between as well. And this starts becoming very complex and hard to manage from a, from a load balancing IT perspective because now you need to understand where the traffic is going, what type of applications reside on what type of platforms, and make sure all the connections work right. And ultimately, that load balancer is not enough. So the traditional model, like Brian said, is to go with a hardware model. And if you need more, what do you do? You buy a bigger piece of hardware. So we buy bigger load balancers to support the number of applications, the number of amount of bandwidth, number of connections, the amount of encryption, and everything else that we need. Again, we have this problem. 
we have a problem that this one big thing becomes this one big point that we need to address. So how do we scale that? We buy multiple instances of big load balancers. So we now have high availability pairs running multiple environments in multiple situations, whether it's private data center, public cloud, private cloud, software-defined data center. And we have all these big hardware monolithic devices and technologies to support this environment. And ultimately, this is how we feel. As the IT operations, as the IT architect, here I am pulling my hair out wondering, what the heck have I gotten myself into? And how do I deal with this? How do I manage this? Because I have so much stuff going on and it's really complicated. So the problem that we have is that the old way of this legacy model just doesn't cut it. The traditional model of buying the biggest device, in this case an application delivery controller, that we can afford to support the application things that we need is how we do things today. And number two, we're consolidating workloads. In other words, all these different applications that we have, we're putting behind this one big device want this one big function. Number three, we're leveraging this hardware-based multi-tenancy. So these applications that we're serving don't necessarily have any relationship to each other. Some of them might be dealing with uh, sales and CRM, customer relations, and some of it might be HR, some of it might be finance. Some of it might be some R&D development application or some other pieces, but there's lots of different things that we're putting into this one workload, into this one device that now impact each other. And to add more capacity, we buy more. We buy bigger. And like Brian said, one of the problems that we have is we have this refresh that we tend to do things on a CapEx model in terms of acquisition, depreciation, where we buy for a three-year or a five-year cycle. And buying for that three to five year cycle just is inefficient at multiple levels. So legacy load balancer problem number one, we're moving to cloud. We're moving to public cloud. We're moving to private cloud. So we have these applications, whether they sit on virtual machines and containers and microservices, we're migrating them from the left to the right. And the problem is that we need to make sure that that technology that we're using, such as load balancing. And by the way, let me just state here, we're not talking about this problem with load balancing and how we go from legacy to this new model that we want to talk about. It's not just load balancing, it's all network services that we want to be thinking about in this frame of mind. So whether we're talking about firewall, IPS, antivirus, anything like that, if it's a network service, the same concept applies. But what we want to do, is we want to take that application and move it to these different environments. We want to be able to move them without any issues in terms of compliance, in terms of policy, in terms of architecture, functionality. But if we're dealing with hardware technology, how does that hardware technology have public like cloud like AWS or Azure? It doesn't go there. We need to find a model where we get the same functionality that translates across all the different environments that we have, whether it's public, private, or legacy tunnel. Problem number two is that these application architectures really have evolved. And this is why we're going to this virtualization to the containers, to the microservices. Because like I said earlier, we want that agility. Agility means ability to change things quickly. It's a cloud specific term. And we want to be able to change our applications quickly because we have this concept of DevOps. We have this concept of CI, CD continuous integration, continuous development, agile processes, et cetera, where you want to change things quickly and easily. So I want to be able to tweak one of my microservices applications, components of my application. And that tweak then rolls into the application in real time. And now I can make these multiple tweaks on a daily, weekly, hourly basis, however the case may be. Again, moving away from that model where we got patches and updates that were megabytes and gigabytes in size and we only got this patches every six months because there are 200 different changes in those patch releases so we want to make those quick changes quickly on all these services 
but we're still, as you can see here, sitting behind this one big load balancer or a pair of load balancers over high availability. And the problem here is that when we talk about this high availability in this one load balancer, a point of failure or a single point of failure. And this is, gives us, brings up the term blast radius. And when I say blast radius, in other words, if that load balancer technology fails, I have now impacted a lot of different applications potentially. So one failure can impact multiple applications across multiple services and departments and can really create havoc on your business. So if we want to try to, if we can, spread out the services for the network services like the load balancer, similar to how we're doing it for the application and breaking it down. Problem number three is this concept of multi-tenancy, where we have this one big load balancer, as you can see in the middle of this diagram. But we have different departments having different applications that have different requirements. I always like to ask my customers, for the applications that you have on your network, do you have SLAs? service level agreements defined for the performance of those applications. And honestly, 95% of those customers will tell me, no, we don't, or I think we do, but I don't know what they are. These applications have different priorities at the business level. Some are more important than others. Things like going to the internet and surfing on social media are very low priority. Meanwhile, sales is extremely high priority because that's what generates my revenue. And a coin county and an HR, they're pretty important. So, and within each department, different applications have different priorities and they have different functions in terms of what the requirements are. A voice over IP application is much more important in terms of latency, jitter, throughput than email, which is more on demand. So we need to have these applications defined in terms of business priority, network priority, and the requirements. And we need to separate them by putting them all together within a single component like the hardware load balancer. Even if we try to carve that hardware load balancer into multiple units, if that hardware has a failure, you are now impacting all of those applications across all of those environments. And we need to try to restrict that. We need to protect ourselves on that level. So why is this traditional model of showstopper going back to the problems that we discussed here? Number one, that traditional hardware and virtual appliance model that we have today is too rigid. We need that flexibility to scale up and down, to break things apart, to really separate the capability things are done. It takes way too long to provision application delivery services because you have so many components and interactions when you have everything within that one hardware load balancer process. It really is hard for you to do that quick, agile change process without understanding all the potential impacts. Now you have a lot of application delivery controllers or load balancers in many places. And they could be different flavors because, again, if I'm going from my legacy environment data center to my public cloud, and I'm also migrating to my private cloud or software-defined data center, I might end up using different technologies and different vendors in different places, and they work differently. And there's a heavy reliance on external tools to troubleshoot these problems because now that I have these different components in different environments, I'm not using one centralized tool necessarily to manage all these pieces and get all the information. And going back to the initial uh, uh, thoughts on the previous slide, that hardware acquisition model, like Brian said, is hard to ignore. If I'm talking about that three-year, five-year CapEx cycle, and like Brian said, you need to predict how much you're going to be using or needing in three to five years. And I can guarantee you that every single prediction you make today about three to five years from now in terms of your IT infrastructure is wrong. It's never right. It's either too much or it's too little. Too much means I overspent. Too little means I need to go back to my CFO and beg him for more money 12 months later. 
We need ways to make things more consistent and predictable in terms of making sure we right size our IT environment for the demands that we have. So what we want to discuss here is this per app ADC or load balancing fabric, where we want the ability to be able to spin up these instances of these services, of this load balancing services, quickly and easily. So if I have my agile process and I need to spin up an instance of an application or a piece of an application, either because it's new or because I need to scale out and create more resource availability for this application, I need to be able to do it quickly and easily. I need to be able to make changes to my application infrastructure and correspondingly, I need to make changes to my load balancing application delivery infrastructure. I need to enable this hybrid and multi-cloud dependency. I need to scale in and out. In other words, I need to add more resources quickly and easily, and I need to change those resources quickly and easily. So this dynamic ability to adjust. So what we have here in this diagram we're showing you, you're gonna have multiple applications, and they could be private cloud. Here we're showing you an OpenStack version of my private cloud software defined data center. Or it might be in Microsoft Azure public cloud or AWS cloud. And I have these different applications. And it could be the same application in multiple clouds for redundancy, availability, disaster recovery, uh, cloud bursting. There's lots of different terms we can use here. And we need load balancing in front of these applications. And we want to make the load balancing per application. Note I did not say per server. You don't need to load balance per server, but for an application might have multiple servers and multiple components, we need to load balance for that application. And ultimately, no matter what environment you're in, you can see here we have Kemp 360 Central at the bottom, which is the centralized management analytics control automation to manage the application delivery across all the different platforms. In other words, what we want to do is we want to give you consistency, no matter what environment you're in, whether it's legacy data center, cloud, public cloud, and we want to give you that consistency from a single point of control so that the technology works the same, it looks the same, and is managed the same, no matter where the environment is. The functionality should not depend upon the location. So typically how we look at licensing today and how we purchase this technology today is we usually buy what we call perpetual licenses. We buy a license for a certain product capability. For load balancers, it tends to be based on the total bandwidth it's capable of, like a one gig license, a 10 gig license, a 40 gig license, whatever the case may be. So what we need to do is when we pay today is we determine what is the maximum license capacity, how many clusters do we need, and translate that to the total cost for the load balancing functionality that we need. Well, the problem with this model is that when we look at that perpetual license, you end up paying for more than what you use you end up paying for a lot more than what you use because, again, you do not want to hit that cap capacity because if you hit 100% capacity, it means that you're losing some of the capability, some of the traffic, some of the performance of that application. And that translates either to disgruntled employees, disgruntled customers, lost revenue, et cetera. So you always over-provision with these licenses that we purchase. The problem is that the usage is not consistent, so we need to over-provision based on the peak usage. And so, like Brian said, if I have a lull in my business, I'm paying for that capacity for a large bit that is unused, and then when I have a peak in that business, which may happen once or twice a year, for example, in the education, higher educational environment, they have peak capacity usage during, like, uh, registration period or during exam period, but during the rest of the year, it could be very low consumption. But they have to provision based on that peak usage. Let's go back to this concept of utility. 
metered licensing. Brian brought up uh, some good examples talking about the utility of the water and electric bill. And I like using the example of the electric bill because what we want to do is think of this meter that's sitting on the side of my house. And I'm old school, so this meter has this, has this little wheel spinning in it, showing how much electricity I'm using. I know the new ones are digital with numbers and everything, but I like the spinning mechanical things. So, but inside my house, I have all of these outlets and devices. And some of them are running full time. Some of them are not running full time. Some of them use a lot of energy, some don't. So examples, my, my air conditioning system during the summer runs very high usage and it runs most of the time during the summer. It runs almost nothing during the rest of the year. My stove, when I turn it on, it uses a lot of electricity. And then I turn it off, it uses zero. All these outlets that I have in the wall, they're not doing anything. But when I plug something in, now they are giving some electricity based on whether I turn that switch, the light switch on or off for the lights and the computers and everything else. So this is like what we want to do for this per app licensing for ADC for this load balancing, where you can deploy anything that you want anywhere. And you don't get charged for it being deployed. In other words, if my light is, is plugged into the wall, but the light switch is off, I'm not paying for that light. Only when the light switch is on. So only when my deployed instance of this service is receiving traffic for load balancing, do we get metered and billed for it. So metered licensing is this on-demand capability that you can provision and establish in advance but only get billed for the usage as it's getting used. So the model that we look at is having an infinite number of ADC instances, an infinite number of load balancers. In other words, like I said, we want to give you the ability to have load balancers anywhere you want, but if they're not being used, you are not being charged for them. So you are in control of where and when you deploy. You don't have to come back to the vendor every single time for a procurement cycle to install or deploy a new instance of this load balancing technology. Unlimited license capacity for each instance. In other words, the instance is not limited based on how much it can perform. Its limitation is where it's being installed and what, how many CPUs you're applying to it, how much memory, how much uh, network interface capacity you're giving to that. But the instance itself has no limit on the license because it's going to be charged based on the usage. So the usage will go up as much as necessary and then that gets metered and billed accordingly. And ultimately, all these load balancing instances are going to be centrally managed and controlled from that Kemp 360 central platform. So you can see which ones are deployed, which ones are turned on, how much is being used, and how much consumption you're going to be built for for all those different devices and applications. And ultimately give you complete control of your environment to be able to give you that agility and elasticity, that scale up, scale down, that CI/CD process that we talked about to really control how your application delivery infrastructure is managed and put you in driver's seat. So hopefully this was very useful for you, gave you some good insights, and I appreciate you attending. And Roger, we're going to pass it back to you So for any questions and answers, and I appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much, Frank. And we do have a few questions that we've got time to go through several of them. First one is, I have applications in AWS and Azure. How many load balancer appliances am I limited to? So that's a good question. And the answer is, like I said in the last slide, it's really unlimited. We want to put you in control. So you are in charge of how many you deploy. So you can deploy as many and as, li and as few as you want based on the application environment that you have. How many applications do you have out there? How many load balancers do you need for each application? Because the last thing that we want when you go to this utility model is to have to come back to the vendor every single time for a procurement cycle. 
because we know that procurement cycle takes time and there's pain involved in terms of dealing with purchasing and finance and all these other pieces. So we want to give you the ability and the flexibility to say wherever you need and however many you need to deploy these instances, you can. So when we talk about these public cloud environments, they scale technically not infinitely, but darn close to it. So you can deploy as many instances of these web balancing uh, components as you need for the different applications that you have. Okay, next question we've received is, what happens if I deploy double the amount of ADCs ahead of an expected traffic surge and I leave them running after the event? So, again, this is this is a good question. And when we talk about deploying and pre-deploying, and let's also talk about another aspect, high availability. We tend to deploy our network technology in a high avail highly available model, whereas active standby. So if we pre-deploy these instances, again, like in my utility model, my, my home electric model, if I'm plugging it into the wall but not turning the light switch on, there's nothing, there's no electricity flowing. In our case, there's no traffic going through the instance, then there's nothing being charged for it. So you get billed nothing for the pre-deployment once you do some minor testing and then there's a small bit of traffic. And then you have the event. And after the event, if you don't tear it down immediately and it's still there and there's no traffic, you don't get build if there's no traffic or you can build for the traffic that there is, which is zero. And so going back also just referring to that highly available model when we're talking about active standby, that standby unit is receiving no traffic. It's not built. So, so essentially, and there are some minor nuances possibly, but essentially that standby unit is free. The highly available capability is free because it's being built based on the usage, not on it being sitting there and existing. Very good. And we've got time for one more question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, this one uh, I think actually is a good question. How do you properly plan for costs when the system counts in bills monthly? That's a great question, and that's something that we hear all the time from our customers is if we're moving to this monthly billing OPEX model, like Brian said, the CapEx and OPEX differences, if we're moving to this operational expense model where we're being billed monthly, how can we consistently know what we're going to be using and being billed for? Well, there are two things that we can do. Number one is we're going to do, we and the customer are going to do our predictive planning. And really and truly, there's going to be some sort of consistency throughout the system. It's the law of averages and the way this model, model works is you're going to come into some sort of general scheme of things. Just like my house, I'm going back to my electricity bill. When I get billed monthly for my electricity bill, even though I could be turning things on and off at different times, I have a pretty good sense of what I'm going to be billed at on a monthly level. So as a business, you can start making these collecting this information and making these guesses, reasonable guesses, in terms of what you're going to be built on at a monthly level and know what you're going to be using. And there are going to be some fluctuations, but they should be minor fluctuations. So the other thing that we can do is we can look at the statistical model. We can do, like, for example, a 95th percentile. In other words, if there's something that's really out of scope, that's really odd, that does not make sense in terms of the traffic that you've seen because there is one freaky thing that happens. We can say, you know what, it's outside the 95th percentile in terms of the expected type of traffic we're seeing. We're going to throw that data point away. We're just going to trust that that's an anomaly, and we're just going to make things as consistent for you. So we try to make things as consistent and predictable as possible for our customers when we look at this utility building model. Well, that's all the time we have. So for the remaining questions that we received, as I mentioned earlier, we will be forwarding those on to our speakers uh, who can follow up with you separately on those. So you can be sure to get those answered. And on behalf of TechGenix, I want to thank you, Frank, and Brian Posey for joining us today. We hope you found today's event beneficial to both you and your organization. And we want to thank Kemp for making it possible to bring it to you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending, and you may now disconnect.